Okay, so uh, how many of you watched the video of the lecture for the UI? Good. Why nobody else watched it? I specifically ask watch it. Um, so I'm not gonna repeat it and then some of the things that were there I'm not gonna repeat neither. So it's a little bit like uh, you have to fill in uh, some of the gaps. Uh, logistically what I've done is I've put um, we have been contacted by uh, some students from the Video Goenda School and they have some idea of a game or some app. Um, so th those ideas will be kind of listed under project ideas, right? Um, so if you go to this page, you will have kind of a list of different uh, project ideas that you can pick as a project. And this uh, Video Goenda School guys will be like number one. And then we will keep adding ideas here. If you have your own idea, if you want to develop something yourself, like you have an idea for a game or for a, some app and you want to do it in a group, you can put the project idea on that page yourself. Um, and then we will review all the ideas. And all the approved ideas, then you can subsequently select as your project for the group. Right? So then there is a separate page which uh, combines what is the group so which students are, uh, you know, forming a particular group. So you list all your names and then you provide some little details of, you know, who, who the group is and which project you, you're going to do. Um, yeah, we usually don't have to worry about it yet. Um, we will have like a kick start day probably mid-March about the projects. Uh, but you can start thinking of what you want to do for the, for the projects. Um, so I encourage you to kind of, you know, brainstorm and uh, organize yourself into uh, groups uh, with whom you want to work. Um, we will have, uh, so the project ideas page will have some external stakeholders. For example, this, these students who want, from the students from the high school who wants to have something done. Um, it is It is possible to have two groups working with the same stakeholder, and we had that before. So, for example, we had a, a startup company which was doing um, um, kind of like a, a board. So imagine that you have like a wooden board which you can put on, on the grass or in your garden. And the board, I don't remember, was like three meters by two or something like this, right? And then um, you can kick the ball. You can use a soccer ball and kick the ball against the bo the, this board. And the board has an attached smartphone and it was calculating how many hits you've done per minute and it was calculating like where exactly you hit it, like you had some targets and if you hit it at the target you get points and so on. So they were trying to gamify this board by attaching a phone to it and have the uh, software analyze what is happening, right? So for example, if you just attach the phone to the board, it's easily detect the shakes from the hit of the ball, right? So if you use accelerometer, you can easily count the number of hits which you have, right? That's trivial. But calculating exactly where the ball hit is not that trivial with an accelerometer kind of attached to the, bo the board. So students had an idea that what they can do is you have a little, uh, like in the very middle of, the, of this board, you have a bit of a hole, you put the phone there, and they use the shakes of the board, but they also use the uh, phone camera to see exactly where the ball is going to hit the, the board, right? So if the ball hits exactly like in the middle, it's easy because it covers the camera for a moment. But if it hits just next to the, uh, uh, the middle, you can kind of estimate from the tracking of the ball where exactly it will hit. Um, so there were two groups who were doing kind of uh, gamifying this board for them, right? Uh, and it is okay. Uh, so sometimes we have multiple groups working for the same stakeholder as long as the stakeholder has enough capacity to kind of consult with two groups. But sometimes like if these guys need to meet with somebody and so on, it would be cumbersome to have two groups doing the same thing. Um, so we will kind of prioritize whoever is first, right? So whoever locks a particular project first will have a priority uh, unless the stakeholder wants multiple things. Um, so we had uh, 
in the past with this board, for example, one group was focusing more on gamifying the experience, like how to communicate with the users, whether the, there will be a single phone with a single display calculating all the statistics, or whether you will have like your own phone, which tells you like uh, that I'm kicking now and then, you know. Uh, so one group was focusing more on the gamification aspects, and the other group was focusing more on the technology, like how to detect the the hits, how to calculate the accuracy of the hits, and so on. Um, so we may have a, kind of a number of stakeholders and some ideas. Uh, some will be internal to the school, some will be external, um, and then you can pick. As, as I was saying, you can pick your own idea as well. So if you want to do something on your own, you can. And we did have in the past projects which were running um, their own things. So we had a one bachelor group which was doing a game and then for the project they ported it to be a mobile game, right? Um, so there was one um, there was one interesting project as well. So if you have a phone, um, so phone has a landscape mode or portrait, right? So if you imagine a platformer and you have platforms um, on the screen, right? So in the landscape mode, let's say you have a platform and then you have a jump, right? So in the landscape mode, you will see the jump because it's like, you know, in the landscape. But if you turn the phone portrait, then you only see that part of the screen. So you will not see the jump, right? You will, your, your platform will end here. And then sometimes you have something high. So in the uh, landscape mode, you may have a platform which is here and you cannot see it. But if you turn your phone like this, you see your platform and then new platform above because you have more uh, real estate. So there was one group which was doing a kind of a simple platformer, but they used the game mechanic of turning your phone up and down, uh, I mean landscape or portra portrait, to see part of the screen which the other mode doesn't allow, right? So then you can have, uh, you know, you can for example run and then turn the, like, you, you're running like this and then you turn your phone and you see the, the upper platform and then you can jump on it, turn it back and so on. And then you see kind of what is happening, right? Uh, so they've used the phone as a way to kind of make the simple 2D platformer a little bit more interesting because you have to turn your phone to actually see what you are supposed to do. Um, it was kind of cool, cool project as well. Um, so it's up to you. Um, there are some rules. The rules are you cannot use Unity and you cannot use any frameworks. You have to kind of code yourself stuff, right? But you can use frameworks in C++. So the, this game, guys, they actually use C++. They use SDL and they use their own kind of uh, uh, rendering engine which they developed in the graphics course. And that's fine. So you can do a native app yourself if you want to and you can reuse what you already have but you cannot use Unreal or Unity to generate a game and then just click a button saying, yeah, I want a mobile version and then you have a mobile version, right? Uh, because then you don't really learn uh, about the mobile programming and mobile uh, aspects. Unless you're really doing something clever with the UI or with the phone sensors or something like this, right? So in that case, if you really need to have it on mobile and the interactions are very tailored for mobile, then we may allow using Unity or something like this, right? Uh, if you were to do something with augmented reality or virtual reality, uh, where you have the Google Cardboard or something like this, of course you can use frameworks, right? So for that part, if you, again, you, it has to be somehow, um, like so, some elements must have to do with the phone, right? Uh, if it is just, you know, a, a 3D uh, scene which just works in the uh, virtual headset, same as on the mobile, yeah, it's not probably enough mobile aspects for it to be considered a mobile project. Um, but if you want to use Cardboard API or if you want to do something like with code, of course, you can uh, choose whatever. It can be a simple 3D scene. Uh, we had a guys who did... Uh, uh, kind of like an um, infinite runner game. So you're basically in a kind of a corridor, the game was called Corridor, uh, and you just have a corridor, <laughs> and you're basically flying kind of at faster and faster, and you have like bats and, and flies kind of are trying to kind of disturb you, and you have to kind of navigate yourself around the obstacles, right? Um, 
the game was brilliantly done. It, it rendered really fast and it worked really well, but you got really seasick like very quickly, right? So like uh, flying through the corridor and trying to avoid the obstacles in a VR headset, like in the cardboard headset was uh, very noisy, right? I, I could play it for like 20 seconds and then I was kind of sick. Uh, so, yeah, you, you know, use your creativity. So you can pick what, whatever you want, you can put it here we will review all the ideas and we will put the external ideas here as well. Sometimes it is kind of fun to work with an external partner because they have, um, they have some cool ideas which are not limited by the technology, right? Uh, we often got requests uh, for doing something on mobile which is like, yeah, it's cool but it's impossible, <laughs> right? Uh, so you can kind of learn some, uh, some, some things which we don't see because we know the limits of the technology, right? But for external people who don't see all the limits, they kind of, their creativity is sort of more, um, sometimes bigger uh, than, than ours. Uh, and also it is cool to do something that other people will use. So we had kind of a number of projects with companies from SESE and so on, which wanted something like a simple app for managing, you know, items that they are tracking or something with QR codes. And they actually use it um, because then it kind of helps their job. So you can end up with developing something which is used in real life uh, after the course. And it's kind of a good thing to put on your CV and so on. You, it kind of becomes your portfolio of what you have done in the past when you're applying for jobs. You can kind of demo it or showcase it. And it's kind of a great asset. So that's why we have those little labs, which are like, you know, things you cannot really show your future employers. And you have the project, which is something that you can put a little bit more effort in and have something that you can carry forward. Like you can, I'm not saying you will be developing it after the course. You, that's not the point. The point is that you have something that you can demonstrate. It's part of your portfolio. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on the ideas. If you have some ideas, put them in. Um, and if you already want to form a group, you can. Uh, you can start working on the projects early. Um, as for the deadlines, uh, I, I need to stress it again that we don't do time management for you, like you're doing the time management for yourself. So those dates are like, you know, really late in a sense that if you keep those dates, you probably be in trouble, right? Uh, doing the projects and doing everything. Uh, so try to submit things earlier. Uh, we will try next week to put the new labs in, uh, at least two and three. Uh, so you get a bit of a perspective of what is expected uh, and uh, with the peer review system, with the submission system and the peer review system, um, yeah, we, th there are two things. So one thing is that we've used particular system last year uh, and it is based on like uh, Google Sheets and kind of Google Forms, right? It's not great, but it kind of works and it works with us and it was working with students. Um, it has um, two small problems. So one is that it's a little bit cumbersome. Um, and second one, there is no real uh, security in the system. It's, it relies on trust that nobody screws things over, right? Uh, which never happened, which is fine. But th those two things are kind of a little bit, um, uh, yeah, problematic. And then the last one is that we were not able to have like automated tests um, because what we would like to have and what we have uh, last year, not in the last mobile, uh, cloud course, but a year ago is that you can submit your, for example, lab one and the system will score it for you immediately and tell you what you're missing or what you have not done perfectly, right? Uh, instead of a human doing that. Uh, it has a benefit that you kind of get immediate feedback. So you submit it and it sort of checks if what it was expected is there, right? Um, this automation with the last year and the previous year systems was not possible. So we're working on a new system where this is possible. But the problem is that the virtual group which is working on it is actually working on it now, right? So we don't know if that will be ready like, you know, towards mid-March or something for us to be testing it or not. So I haven't put a system yet whether we will use the old one or the new one uh, because um, it, it is a little bit dependent on the progress the students will be doing. 
if the students kind of progress fast enough that we can start using what they will have, it will make life easier because then it will have like a concise interface, you will have kind of like a simple login and then it will keep the state and it will be more secure and more, more private and it will be a little bit better. Uh, but I'm not sure if they will manage that. If they will not manage that, we have to fall back to the old system, right? Uh, so, and, and we cannot have both. Like once we decide to use the old system, that's it. Like we will not have time or power to kind of transit to the new system uh, if they have it. So I'm kind of postponing the decision on whether we fall back to the old system or start using the new one uh, for another couple of weeks until we can make this decision based on day progress. Um, it doesn't really affect you, like in feature-wise. It can only make it better. Uh, so if we can use the new system, it will be better, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. So um, the peer review system itself is kind of the same. Like you have to look at other people submissions and check if they fulfill the requirements. Uh, but as a, as a submitter, if we have those automated checks, you can get a feedback immediately. So you don't need to wait for somebody to look at your code saying, well, your code is you know, missing some tests or missing something that was required in the lab, right? Uh, for the lab one, there is not much um, kind of automated requirements that we specified. So, um, there are some things. Um, there are some things that we kind of require by default. Um, but for this one, I don't think we. Um, yeah, it's only the behavior of the back button, which is kind of the the default thing. Uh, we don't really stress code quality. We don't stress uh, tests, um, and the UI can be kind of arbitrary as well. Um, so you only have some uh, naming conventions that you should follow that we could test automatically. Um, yeah, so yeah, lab one is kind of, uh, you don't really, uh, we, we don't grading you on uh, code quality and uh, some of the aspects that we will be putting in later. So for example, for lab three and four, you will have to have tests um, and then we can check if you have tests and if you don't, so on. But yeah, I, you know, it, it's not a big deal. Uh, it's not a um, huge difference to marking it manually and getting a feedback uh, through the automation. Um, all right, so any questions about this? No questions? Okay, so um, the other thing that we've done is we have now kind of the exercises for working with the UI. Um, so we encourage you, those should take you like few minutes. Um, and I have some, if you have some ideas or uh, the teaching assistants will have some ideas, they will put them in here as well. Um, so we have things that we've already done, like on the last lecture, like we were playing with the fab button uh, and the snack bar was generated automatically by the Android Studio for us. Uh, we could, uh, like, do you know how would you use the clicking on the button to open a browser? Who knows how to do that? So I have, I have my code. Uh, I, I will do that in, in a minute, but I will have my code. I have to have a, uh, a button which opens a browser with a particular page. So for example, sometimes you have an app and you have like the privacy policy and you click on the privacy policy and then you have a browser opening some sort of a web page with the privacy policy for that app, right? How would you do that? How complicated is it? Yep. Uh, yeah. I don't think for that one you need a permission, actually. You may need um, internet access. Yeah, we can check that. Um, but the, so how would, you, how would you solve it? You would Google it, find a way on uh, Stack Overflow, how people do it, right? Um, which is fine. Uh, so 
about the process. Um, Googling things and finding things is good. You should do that. Um, you should try to find more than one answer, right? So often the first answer you find is not the kind of the good one. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So the safe way is you find the one way of doing something and then you try again to find an alternative way of doing something, right? And then you can compare, you can make a judgment which one is better and for what reason, right? And that's what happened, like one student kind of checked how can you wire up um, behavior to button clicks and uh, he find, found that you can do it by the uh, registering the callback, that's what we did in the last uh, class, right? But also you can have a function called something, like you can make an arbitrary function name but as long as it returns void and takes a view as a parameter, so it has a particular signature, right? Uh, then you can wire up this behavior uh, into the, the function button through, um, yeah, through this inside XML. You have kind of, a, uh, so for this element, you will have a block of XML and then one of the properties is Android on click. And then if you say when on click happens, when this event happens, then this function should be called, right? Then you don't need to register the callback, right? Um, so those are two alternative ways of achieving the same behavior. And then there is a bit of a discussion of how, you know, which one to choose and so on. Uh, so it's often with code as well. You Google something, you find one way of doing something, and then you use it, but it's, it's, it's not the best way, right? Uh, and you don't know if, if it's best or not because you don't know what the alternatives are. So I encourage you to always look for at least two ways of doing something. Uh, sometimes there is, the problem is so trivial that it's really just one way of doing something, right? There is no alternative way. Uh, so then it's fine. Uh, but most often than not, there is, even for the, the stuff that only has one answer, there are always people who come up with some, con con you know, convoluted alternative answer, right? Um, all right, so um, what we can do today is we could go through some of the, um, some of the things that are here. Um, I don't know because, uh, like, I can tell you stuff that I find you know, either easy or hard, but I need you to tell me what you are struggling with, what, you know, what do you need to understand more, right? Yeah? Passing data between activities? All right, great. So, what do you know about it so far? Yeah? Okay. You don't need content providers with, with uh, uh, start activity for result, right? Uh, so that's kind of uh, too much. Um, what, um, all right, so what do you know about intents? What is an intent? Yeah. yeah. So uh, as we were discussing about the, uh, the components, uh, we have a component which is called activity. And the activity is sort of like a, a process, right? So if you have uh, on your PC, if you're using Windows, you have exe files, like executables. And if you run one exe file, it may, may open a window and you can interact with it. And if you run another exe file, it opens another window, right? And now I have two windows, right? Uh, on a mobile phone, usually you have one after the another because I cannot see both at the same time. I can only see one. That's the whole point be behind activities, that there is only one on top. But on a PC, you can kind of imagine that it's you actually see both at the same time, right? So can you use variables from this activity from, you know, in this activity? Yeah? If if the variable is static, then you can use it, right? But the instance variables, you cannot, right? So instance variables are not visible between the, uh, the activities. Um, 
With the static ones, there is a little bit of a, a complexity of how the activities are running, okay? In the manifest file, you can say a particular activity should run in a separate process, in which case, um, the static variables from this activity will be different to static variables from this activity because they actually don't share anything, right? So, and it's the same with services. If you, that's what I was telling you before that for simplicity's sake, we sometimes use a trick where we uh, instantiate a service from within the class that we already have and then we start it from that code, which means we are kind of in the same VM and we are, can reuse variables, right? Uh, but often, you know, sometimes the, the case is that you have two processes that don't um, occupy the same virtual machine, in which case even static variables from one process will not be the same as the static variables from another, right? Uh, so you can use static variables, but it's, um, it has to comply with some restrictions and it's kind of limited, right? And also having static variables is kind of not a very good practice, right? So if I have one exe file and another exe file, I have one source code for this and another source, source code for this, I cannot really reuse variables, right? So how can those two things communicate? How can one process on your PC talk to another process on your PC? Yeah, so you have something kind of uh, something similar on especially on Unix, which is pipes, standard input and standard output. Um, so you can chain some of the flow between the processes. Uh, what else could you use? You can use network, exactly. So you could use loopback interface and kind of uh, communicate through a network between the two processes, right? You can use a disk. So one process writes something to a disk, another process reads from a disk. You can use a database, right? Uh, Android has something which is called properties, which is like a key value store. So one process can put something into the store, another activity can read from the store, right? So for example, if I have one activity which says uh, login, and then I, I click like button login and I click on it and I have another activity saying username and password, right? Uh, and then I, s I click here login, right? Uh, but the login logic actually happens in the original activity, it just needs the two fields, right? There are kind of multiple ways of achieving that, right? So one way is that this activity now will store the current user and current uh, password into a properties come back to this activity and this activity will read it from the properties and try to log in the user, right? Or you can do it more dynamically. So you can use start activity for result. This activity collects the two fields of data, bundles it and returns as a bundle back to the calling activity, right? Sometimes you want to pass data from the callee to, uh, from the caller to the callee, right? So the first activity has some data which needs to be displayed or you know, are shown in the other activity and you want to pass data this way. And that's exactly what you said. You can bundle up the data into a key value store called bundle and then put it into the intent and then the other activity will kind of read it from the intent when the activity starts, right? Um, so it depends how, like what sort of problem you're dealing with, then there is a more or less appropriate solutions to, to do that. Uh, the concept of passing the bundle is Conceptually quite simple. You basically have two processes and instead of you doing all the networking and all this thing, it happens for you behind the scenes and you operate on something called bundle, right? And the bundle is, um, so if I Google Android bundle, it's kind of a fancy name for a key value store, right? Uh, so I have, um, I have a bundle class uh, and interestingly, the class is final. What does it mean that the class is final in Java? Yep, so it means you cannot have a 
subclass which extends bundle, right? It's illegal to have a class which extends bundle. So bundle extends base bundle. So base bundle cannot be final, but bundle itself is final, which means there will be no uh, sub subclasses of bundle, right? Uh, you can define the entire class as, as final, or you can declare a single method as final, which means a subclasses cannot override that method. They, there is like, this method is the only implementation that is ever allowed, and then nobody can override it, right? Uh, so you, you do that for preventing some of the abuse of the APIs and some of the behavior change if you allow some of the inheritance in the object hierarchy, in the class hierarchy, yeah? Ask it again. Yeah. Which class? The R class. Yeah. So uh, the yeah the R class is made final but the code for it is generated based on the, all the IDs that you have in your project. So, you, like, nobody can extend it in a sense, but it is kind of dynamic during the compilation process because this class is generated, right? So what Android Studio and the build tools do, they browse all your XML and see all the IDs that you are kind of using, and then it, they generate the R class for you, and they make it final, and then you cannot subclass it and add anything new or change anything, but you're kind of changing it by adding new IDs and recompiling everything, right? But it's the same with the bundle. Like if the um, Apache Foundation or whoever is providing source code for the class bundle changes something internally and recompiles it and reships it with the new version of Android, then of course the bundle class sort of changes, right? But it's not being able to be changed kind of dynamically when you already have it in binary form, right? So it's the same with the R class. Once the R class is generated and compiled, that's it, it's sealed. But during the build process, you always regenerate the R, right? And in the early days, uh, it was a nuisance actually, because uh, like we didn't use Android Studio in early days, we used Eclipse, and there was a different build process, and this stupid R file was always out of sync with what you were doing, right? So you added a new I, 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 UI element, You've, gener you've added new IDs, you try to use them, and they, you know, the compiler says, no, we don't know about those. They are not in your R class, right? And then you have to manually regenerate the R class because it was always out of sync. Those problems, like the last year and, and this year I've been building things, I, I, it never happened to me, but it may happen, right? If the R class is out of sync with what actually is in the project. Uh, so sometimes maybe when you're doing pull requests or something with your code base, yeah, the sync might not be accurate and then your R class will be out of sync and then in your code the compiler will complain. But it doesn't mean you have errors in your code, it just means that the R class source code is out of sync with what it should be. Um, yeah, so you have kind of a, you know, you can just construct it uh, and then it's just an empty bundle. Um, and then you can um, put stuff into it, right? Um, so there is a um, set of methods which um, allow you to put stuff into the bundle and reference it by the key. So it's a key value store, which is sort of uh, statically typed. So if you stored something as a byte, you cannot get it as a floating point or whatever, right? It kind of retains the type safety of what you store, that's what you will get, right? And then you have, uh, lots of different things you can store. So you can store bytes, you can store car arrays, cars, floats, integers. Uh, you can store anything that is parcelable. So parcelable is an interface uh, which um, the bundle itself implements. Uh, and then anything that is parcelable can also be put into the, the bundle, right? So sometimes you want your own custom type to be put into a bundle, then all you need to do is to make it parcelable. And what does it mean? Uh, it, it has kind of the martial and unmartial procedure for the um, um, 
Yeah. So there is the concept of a pa parcel, and then you have to have methods write to parcel and uh, read from parcel. Uh, let me just check. Yeah. So you have um, an abstract method which kind of uh, describes what sort of content you have, and then you have uh, a method which writes to a parcel. You will also will need to have uh, kind of a creation out of the parcel, right? So, yeah, to, to, to cut this, the long story short, it's a mechanism for having a some type, and then you have some representation of it, which can be passed over the network, and then you restore the state again on the other end, right? So you're doing marshalling and unmarshalling of some kind of content. Um, all right, so what we can do is we can um, make a task um, where you try to find, um, so yeah, let's go to the, to the exercises. Um, yeah, so I will add a new thing here. Um, so let's do this, uh, generate hello world. Add an extra activity called activity2 with a single text view and in the hello world extend it, extend it to have a text edit field. Uh, add an extra activity called activity2 with a single text view and when when our main activity fab button is pressed, uh, launch the new activity with the text view filled with the new text, okay? So we're passing data from first activity to the second, just by the text, right? So try to do that, and then the second would be uh, the reverse. So you keep, uh, you have, again, you have two activities. Um, so you don't extend the first one to have a text view. You will add an extra activity called activity two with a single uh, edit text field. Uh, when main activity process launches the new activity, then let the user type text. And when the back button is clicked, show the new text in the original main activity. Right? So now we have two tasks. One is for passing data from first activity to the second, and the second task is the reverse. You have the text field in the second one, and when you type something there and go back to the first one, the first one shows the, uh, the activity, right? Um, let's change the second one because uh, the default behavior, like when you run start activity for result, you have new activity, and then you have two options. Either the, the second activity passes the data back or whether it passes cancel back, right? And the default behavior is if you press the back button, it returns with the cancel, right? We don't want to change the behavior of the back button. So let's keep the behavior as it is. We will add a new button which will pass back the data with the OK status, right? Because if you're asking a user for some input and you have two activities, so you have your main activity and then you show show the new activity on top, the user fills something in, but the user then decides to cancel. They say, no, I don't want to do this, what I'm doing. Uh, I don't want to log in anymore. And they have to have ability to cancel that, right? And the, you normally has like OK and cancel buttons, but you can also press back button. And the back button is equivalent to cancel, right? Uh, if you press OK, then the data which you filled in is passed back with the status OK to the original activity, right? So let's change this one to make it simpler uh, and say an extra activity called activity two with a single, yeah. when, yeah, we launch the new, the activity two. So let's call it activity two. 
then let the user type text and when the uh, user user clicks OK button show the new text if they click the back button nothing will change in the main activity it will still show hello world right uh, and extend with a single text field and OK button right make sense all right so try to do that and then after the break I will try to do that right so for those of you who will kind of not be able to find how to do that we do it together okay all right so I will save this 10 minutes break and then after the break um, I will try to do it myself and show you how I would do it <laughs> 